100.7, what's good? It's Reggie Smooth as Butter Brown. You know, I hate stopping the music, but right now the music has to stop. With me on the phone, I have two legendary hit makers. They are responsible for some of the best music of our lives. They've worked with artists such as Janet Jackson, created albums for Janet Jackson, New Edition, um, songs with Usher, Mary J, Luther Vandross, Sherelle. Alexander O'Neill, the list goes on. They are inductees of the Songwriters Hall of Fame, period. They have more Billboard number ones than any other production team in history. Absolutely amazing. With me on the phone, I have the legendary Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Gentlemen, how are you? Good, how are you? Man, I'm sleepy. I couldn't sleep last night thinking about this interview with my idols right now. <laughs> man, I just, well, you should have went to sleep and woke up. Man, I just want you guys to know I was a member of the time in my room playing the bass growing up. Man, I just want you to know. Okay, don't walk with you. <laughs> Gentlemen, I just want to say it's an honor and my pleasure to even be able to talk to you guys on the phone. I've been following you guys since high school, since 81, when you came on the scene. And uh, you are an inspiration to me and a lot of other people that play instruments and produce. And I just want to say it's great to talk to you guys. I'm your biggest fan. I know you hear it all the time, but I'm your biggest fan. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, and I love you guys, man. Wow. That's yeah, nice, that's man. Cool. Well, the, 81 was the, uh, that was the very first time album. That was the very first we album I bought. It together. Yes, yes. Yep, we came into it together, brother. Yep. Yes, we sure did. I was in high school. Yes, I sure was. Wow, where do I start? Um, well, let me ask you, I've only seen you guys with fedoras and shades on. Are y'all wearing them right now? <laughs> Not me. No. <laughs> yeah, no. Man, you guys like wear gym shoes like Air Jordans and Nikes or anything? Goodness. <laughs> yeah, that way, yeah, I'll I take a shower in my fedora. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> there you go. You gentlemen won Grammys and all types of Billboard Awards, um, hundreds of plaques, um, gold, platinum, and diamond albums. Uh, but who's counting? Uh, how does that make you feel as producers? Well, it feels nice. I mean, first of all, we just are so, uh, you know, blessed and, and uh, to do even do music, to be able to do music, but then to do it with the people that we're able to do it with is amazing and obviously it's something we don't do alone it's something that you know with your support um you know since we came into to, to it together um but the listeners and, and people that really support what we do that's what makes it happen um so we we enjoy it we love every day waking up and with a song in our head and, and put it up Wow, what is the process for you guys uh, working with an artist? Uh, do you like turn down artists, or how do you go about picking artists that you work with? I think it's about inspiration. I think if if someone says a name to us and it inspires uh, where we go, oh, we know what to do, or we, we know what that should be, that's always the first thing, because that's where the songs come from. It's really the inspiration of the artist. We generally, we don't write a lot of songs without knowing who the artist is going to be that we're going to work with. Okay. So... Um, it really, a lot of the inspiration comes from the artist, and then um, we just kind of take it from there and kind of figure out, as fans of the artist, then we just kind of go, what would we like to hear the artist do um, as fans? And then we try to then create that, always with the artist's input, though, because we're very collaborative about it. It's, it's really about, you know, trying to make a record for them that they can live with for the rest. Because, well, by the way, when we're done making a record as producers, mm -hmm. We move on to the next project. For them, it's just starting. You know, they right. got to do videos and they got to tour and they got to, you know, do interviews or whatever. So that's really the thing is is try to give the artists things that they really enjoy, that they really embrace, and making them part of the creative collaborative. Wow. Project. Okay. Okay. Um, I got Jet my Janet Jackson shirt on today. I just want you to know that Janet's in the room. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you, That's a great wardrobe, man. There you go. There you go. You gentlemen have a, a unique, crispy sound. Your sound is it's hard to explain, but it's so clear. You can hear the hi-hats and, and everything and every song that you can do. I can always tell. And I think that started with the SOS band back in the day, the sound 
uh, of, of recording the music. It's just, your sound is just amazing. It's real crispy. Well, I, I think a lot of the, the crispiness, as you call it, I like that. I've never heard it described like that, but I do like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but a lot of the crispiness, uh, I, well, I have to, to credit our engineer, who uh, a gentleman named Steve Hodge. Uh, yeah. And uh, Steve, Steve was actually, I think SOS Band, Just Be Good To Me, was actually the first record's uh, and tell me if you still care. I think were the first records that we worked with him on. Okay. But we knew his name from growing up back in the day when you would get albums and you could read the liner notes and actually read who who produced it, who wrote it, who yes. engineered it. Yes. And we saw his name on all the records that we liked. We kept seeing Steve Hodge, and we said, "Okay, when we when we make it, we're going to get Steve Hodge to mix our records." Wow! And sure enough, we did. We we walked in, and it, by the way, when we mixed. Just Be Good to Me, the night we mixed it, Just Be Good to Me was the night we got fired from the time. We fired <laughs> us from the time. Wow. It was the same night. We literally went from the studio getting fired with Prince, walked into the, to the other studio with Steve Hodge. We'd never met him before. And he said, what's wrong with you guys? And we said, oh, we just got fired from the time. And he said, well, I don't think you're going to have any problems because this record you guys got here is a smash. And wow. he was right, just be good to me. And he mixed basically everything from c- control and basically everything that you know that we've done, he mixed all those records for us. So got to yes. shout him out, Steve Hodge. Yes, we're going to talk about Prince in a minute, but the uh, I'm a skater and I'm also a DJ. And everything from the SOS band, we still play till this day. You know, and the sound has, comes across so good. Uh, Tell me if you still care. Uh, all of those songs, just be good to me. Those are skating songs. Weekend girl, those are skating songs, and they sound so good coming across the skating rink and in, in, in the speakers. It sounds so good. That's good. I, you know what? I, I used to skate back in the day, so you know, I love I love hearing that. That's great. There you go. I hear you used to DJ too back in the day. I did, and I DJed at the roller rink. I DJed. I had a radio show that I did. I was in all the different clubs and stuff. And yeah, that was. I, I love doing that, and it, and it so much informed the way that I think we made music um, because uh, because DJs used to tell me like in clubs a lot of times they go, "Man, I love that you put a break right here and whatever." And I said, "Yeah, yeah. that's because when I used to spin." I used to be so mad, like, give me some intro or give me a place to loop the record back or, you know, whatever. So then whenever we did our remixes, we would always make sure to put those things in for DJs and stuff. So, I mean, so much of what we do was just informed by just our growing up life, you know. There you go. Let me ask you, what was your DJ name? Jimmy Jam. That's where I got That's where I got the name from. There was a guy working uh, one of the clubs, actually a club that, that Terry and I, Terry was like playing live music in, in his band in Flight Time downstairs. And I was DJing upstairs. And so um, I used to go down and listen to his band. He used to come up and listen to me spin. And, uh, but there was a bartender there that, uh, my name is James Harris. And he said, man, James Harris, man, nobody knows who that is, man. You got to get a name, you know. And he, he said, man, Jimmy Jam, man. I'm going to call you. I'm going to tell everybody your <laughs> name Jimmy Jam. And I said, okay, cool. So he, he named me. And, uh, and, it, and it just stuck. And then when we got in the time, I remember I asked Prince, and I said, Prince, should I be, what, do you, what should my name be? And he said, Jimmy Jam. <laughs> said, okay, cool. <laughs> so, so that was it. Wow, wow. And Jimmy Jam was a serious DJ. Was he really? A serious DJ. Oh, my God, yes. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that people do now, you know, the, the uh, mixing and everything that they do. Right. He was doing, like, when he was a very young man, and in addition to that, he would actually play live. He'd have a synthesizer in the booth with him. He'd play live and create uh, parts to songs that we would play. And he was he was serious. Wow, that's something. That's something. That's uh, we call those uh, intros or break beats. Now, some of the songs that we uh, DJ with, they have intros at the very beginning. So, uh, right. Okay, now getting to Prince. Um, I hear he fired you because you missed out on a show uh, because of a blizzard? <laughs> yes, yes, although the blizzard was in Atlanta. Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, and, and, and growing up in Minneapolis, I could tell you that it was so not a blizzard. <laughs> I mean, it was like, in Minneapolis, it was what they would call a dusting. Yes, we know about that. And they shut the whole, right, you know what that's about. So they shut the whole airport down in Atlanta. And we missed the, the next time show, which was actually in San Antonio, Texas. Wow. So we missed that show, 
And um, it was okay until Prince found out we were producing the SOS band. <laughs> and then that's where the problem was, because he had told us don't produce stuff outside the time. So, uh, uh. and li- literally, like, I, we got fired. We went from the one studio over and mixed Just Be Good to Me, the SOS band stuff. And that was it. Wow. And, and I like to just add, I, I don't ever say that Prince fired us. I say he freed us. Free? Wow. He basically yeah. allowed he freed us and allowed us to go on to our, whatever our destiny was going to be. So Yes. Um, yeah. It felt like a bad thing at the time was a great thing. Yes, yes. Yep. Double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. Well, the project that you have out now is with a group called The Sounds of Blackness. It's one of my favorite inspirational groups. And uh, I know we play them um, Be Optimistic on the radio back in Chicago back in the day. And um, this group is just amazing. How did you guys hook up with The Sounds of Blackness? We grew up with Sounds of Blackness uh, in Minneapolis. And we would play back when we were just local uh, ba- when we were just a local band, Flight Time. We used to play on a lot of the same uh, gigs that they played on. Okay. Uh, so we were very familiar with them. And around '89, when we were doing uh, Rhythm Nation uh, for Janet, um, we took Janet to a Sounds of Blackness concert. And the whole time at the concert, she's like nudging us, going, "Oh my God, they're amazing! Oh my God, they're amazing!" And we were starting a label, Perspective Records, at the time. And yes. Janet said, you got to sign those guys to your label. And we said, okay. And so we did. And um, Optimistic, of course, was the first uh, single from Perspective and, and from Sounds of Blackness that we did. And it was such a great experience making the record, working with them. But also it was a great experience hearing the way that the music uplifted people's lives. Which yes. to me, that should be what music is about and inspiring people. So fast forwarding, um, oh, I don't know, 30 years or so later, with the Jam and Lewis Volume 1, we thought that for many reasons, Sounds of Blackness was the way to start our project. And um, uh, first of all, having Ann Nesby uh, and Big Jim Wright back in the fold of Sounds of Blackness uh, was very important to us. Um, um, uh, Big Jim Wright unfortunately passed away. Uh, but this is one of his last recordings um, that he did. Um, so this was amazing to have that as part of it. Um, but also, we just felt like we're living in a time now where there's a lot of divisiveness and a lot of hostility, and we felt like uh, this song was almost a love letter to God in a way, and we felt like people need to be uplifted, they need to be inspired, and who better than Sounds of Blackness to do it? Yes. And uh, as a way to kick off our project, we just thought that there was the right it was the right way to go. So, and the response to it has been amazing. You guys' support has been great. But it's just uh, that the thing we hear when people hear the record and they say to us, "Oh my God, that when I hear the blackness at the beginning of it, they go, oh my God, it reminds me of Optimistic.' It's like good because that's what we want to re- we want to remind you of that and make you feel good you know, in your day or whatever it is that you're doing. So many powerful vocals and vocalists in Sounds of Blackness. They are just incredible. I love them. They sound so good. Um, Now, I hear that your project, your new project, is being mixed in DTS 11.1 Immersive Audio for a Surround Audio Experience. Is that some type of new format, Terry? Uh, Well, it's a format that you could be used to. Uh, just because you go to a movie theater and you hear surround sound right, or, or immersive audio in, in a theater, or if you play video games in your headphones, you hear how immersive the sound sounds. So right. what, what it does is for us, it creates a bigger palette for us to create on. Um, normally we have uh, in mixing a stereo mix, which is two speakers. Okay. In this particular format, we go to 11 speakers. And what that is, is there's three speakers across the front, there's two on the sides, and two in the back. Okay. And then we add four height speakers around the corners of the room. And what it does is it gives you a, a feeling that music is coming from everywhere, like wow. you're in the middle of the music. Yes. And um, it, it's, it's an a amazing, immersive feeling that you get. And what we've also been able to do is... Um, gather some other technology from DTS, okay. which is called Headphone X, which is allowing us to take that same 11-1 immersive feeling and place it in headphones. So you don't feel like you have two big boxes on your ears and you're just listening there. You, you, 
you feel the space in the headphones and you feel things coming from behind you and above you and, yes. you and on the side. Wow. And, uh, it's just a, a great immersive concept, I think. Um, and we just need to upgrade uh, the audio concept because, you know, we go, we've gone on television from watching television in 480 and, you know, right. black and white. And we moved up to now 4K, now 8K, Right, um, they're saying. And so we need to upgrade our music experience as well. So yes, yeah, so we're just trying to move the times along. Yes, I know you're deep in the technology, uh, uh, Terry. And is this the, is this the wave of the future? This is the the way albums will be recorded in the future. Is it expensive? No, it's, it's not expensive. I mean, for for the consumer or the listener, all you have to do is have a pair of headphones. Okay, earbuds, whatever. The only thing that you won't be able to use is uh, noise-canceling headphones Okay, uh, with the way the technology is now. But I'm sure in, in, in the future, that will change as well, probably. Um, it, it's not expensive at all. Um, for creators, it's just, like I said, creating a bigger palette. There's no different than buying a new keyboard. Okay. Um, so I, I, I think it possibly can become a format that everybody loves and, and, and adheres, adheres to. But um, at this point, we're just doing what we feel is necessary for this particular project and our projects moving forward just because we just think people deserve to listen to it like we get to hear. It. Yeah. And we built we built a surround booth in our um, in our studio and it's an amazing feeling. When people sit down in the chair, you they uh, I remember we let Usher hear one of his songs and uh, he said I feel like I'm levitating. I it wow. just feels surreal. Wow. So we want everybody to experience it like that. Wow. Wow. Speaking of Usher, you've worked with Usher, uh, the New Edition Project, uh, Janet Jackson, of course, so many artists. Um, I heard Big Sean and Chris Brown, my last, that song went number one on Billboard, and they used uh, Can You Stand the Rain from New Edition. Uh, did you guys have to approve that? Yeah, we did. We And basically nowadays we approve all the samples. Okay. When when people use them, um, but we appreciate it. And I remember early on in our careers when we people thought we would be against sampling. Yeah. Uh, there was a kind of a thought that you know, well, it's not pure way to make music. But to me, it's just another creative expression of music. And I love. I mean, some of our biggest uh, records have been. I mean, even going to Rhythm Nation, which was Sly and the Family Stone. You know, it's like the ability to take songs that have existed before and then repurpose them for a new audience, I think is amazing. And I remember even like when um, I, I was thinking about this the other day, All For You, which was Janet, okay, which was a huge record for her, but the sample in that was The Glow of Love, which was Luca Vandross and yeah. Change. And I remember when I played the sample for Janet, or I played the track for her, she'd never had heard it before. Really? She loved it. And then, right, she hadn't heard it before. And then I remember one of her dancers at the time had walked into the studio and started dancing around and going, oh, I love this, I love this. And it was like, okay, cool. And that's the kind of reaction you get a lot of times from that. You get somebody that remembers the original and it like, makes them like it. And then you have people that have never heard it before that go, oh, I love that, you know? Yeah. So to me, it's a great bridge for music uh, sampling. And as long as everybody gets paid and gets credited correctly, then it's a great thing. So we, we love when that happens. We love when uh, James Brown is funny. I remember when we did That's the Way Love Goes. Uh -huh. Papa Don't Take No Mess as the sample. And I remember James Brown saying, I don't know about I don't know about that, Janet Jackson. You know, some of those lyrics are kind of risque. And we were like, no, <laughs> here, we'll sing you the lyrics, James. It's cool. It's cool. And he ended up, uh, he ended up doing it and ended up being, you know, a number one for, I don't know, eight weeks or some crazy thing. But it's great because then all of a sudden we share something with James Brown, which is, which maybe musically wouldn't be, be able to do. So I don't know. I think it's really cool as long as, like I say, all the business is correct, the credit is correct, and that. So when, uh, yeah, so when Chris Brown and, and that happened, I mean, all of that is, is very complimentary to me. Okay. And also it moves the song forward because what it does is it makes people go, oh, I like that record. I like my last. Wait a minute, what's the sample? Oh, New Edition. Let me go back and listen. Oh, I love New Edition. Yeah. Oh, this is great. No. So I, I love that. Anything that connects, I think that's what the great thing about music is. It is so connective. 
And so I think, uh, you know, sampling just uh, enhances that. Yeah, growing up, I, I listened to all types of music. You'll be surprised. I just left a record store the other day, and I bought some uh, some uh, used records and CDs. But when I heard Joni Mitchell on a Janet Jackson song, the sample, it, it blew me away. I was like, what? Yeah. Man. Well, we had to call Joni and get, get permission for that. What know? did she think about it? Well, she loved it. You know, it was interesting because... She, she was a big Janet fan, and Janet was a huge Joni Mitchell fan. Okay. And I, from uh, roller skating back in the day, I, I was always a fan of uh, a Big Yellow Taxi. It was like yeah. one of those songs I yep. used to hear at the roller rink all the time. Yep. And I always thought it would be really cool if we did a song that c- combined all those things together. And so Janet called Joni and said, Joni, we're, doing, we're taking Big Yellow Taxi and we're doing a sample and, you know, whatever. And Joni just said... Sounds great. I can't wait to hear it. Wow. And, wow. And, so, and from what I understood, she absolutely loved it. And um, so that was great. But you, it, it's such a, to me, and, and the other thing, too, is that uh, I mentioned Glow of Love. One of the guys that wrote Glow of Love, I ran into him at the Grammys. And uh, when All For You was nominated, we actually won a Grammy for All For You. Okay. And I remember running into this guy. He came up to me, and he I, can't, I wish I could remember his name. But uh, anyway, he came up to me, and he said, he hugged me, and he said, hey, man, he said, you bought me my house. Oh. I said, what? <laughs> he, bought, he said, all for you, man. When you sampled it, he said, I was the writer on the song, on the original, and Glow of Love. Wow. He said, you bought me my house. I was like, wow. I said, okay, cool. I mean, so, I mean, once again, the connectivity is, is just very cool. Yes, George Clinton told me that music is recycling. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep yeah, sampling. Right. Yes. He said, that's how I yeah. get paid. <laughs> I was like, wow. That's, right. that's amazing. I recently saw it. I saw this twice on Netflix. And it's talking about the black godfather, Mr. Clarence Avon, a legend yeah. uh, in the game. Uh, how do you feel about Mr. Clarence Avon? <laughs> no words can express how we feel about Clarence Avon. Yes. He is not only the godfather, he is the father, he is he's all of it. I mean, he's an amazing human being. Yes. And um I you know, I I, I could sit here and, and speak volumes about him and I I'm not one of those guys that like to talk a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so I I keep it short. Clarence Avon is awesome. Everyone should watch the Black Godfather. Yes. And you'll see what I'm talking about. It's on Netflix now. I was telling my producer, Bree, about it and uh, another guy that works here at the station. And it's just an amazing, inspirational story. That man was is is amazing. He's, he's still amazing to this day. Yeah, he is. He's, he's, he's the best. And, and he, it's definitely something everyone should see. And I remember that we went to a screening of it early on um, as it was being made. And the I think a lot of the comment was that how do we not know this person? Right. Like how could somebody be so involved with all these people and we've never heard of them? And that is the magic of Clarence. Yes. Is that he's not trying to be, it wasn't about making himself big. It was about making everybody else. Right. Big, you know, and that's the magic of it. So I'm glad to see that uh, it's gotten such a great response. And to me, it should be, it should be required viewing. Like to me, it should be in classrooms at school. and Yes. Curriculum. That's a good, yes. Everybody should know about this man. They should, really. I know you guys have to run, but uh, one more question. Prince, Prince, what, I mean, what have you guys learned from Prince, and uh, what are your feelings? Rest in peace. I met him three times. His brother introduced me to him the first time. Uh, Billy Sparks met me, introduced me to him the second time, and Morris Day took me to him the third time. Uh, Morris just up and said, uh, I, I was watching him rehearse. He said, hey, you want to see Prince? I said, yeah. I thought he was going to go get me some tickets. He took me to Prince and said, hey, Prince, <laughs> Prince, Reggie, Reggie, Prince, uh, I'll be right back. And me and Prince talked one-on-one. Man, I we talked for about 15 minutes. I was so nervous. I was like, oh, my God. How do you guys feel about Prince? What impact has he had on your lives? <laughs> well, Prince... Uh... <laughs> Aside from from being brilliant, uh, was our was well, like our brother. I mean, he's our mentor in some ways. Um, I mean, he, it's hard to deny what he has done musically. Yeah, and, you know, and I don't know why anybody would even try. Uh, how his music has kind of shaped all of us. Mm-hmm. He he was a guy that. 
for us, we watched him break all the rules. I remember just saying to him a couple times, um, I think it was When Doves Cry. He did a song and it didn't have any bass. Well, you can't do a song without bass, Prince. <laughs> he said, why? <laughs> and he needed to do the song it became a number one song. Um, this man was so incredibly talented and well-versed in music. Um, he could play any style. Mm-hmm. You know, and I guess the lesson to take away from it all is that you pretty much can do anything that you want to do if you're willing to put the time in it. Because he was music. That's all he ever did. That's all he ever wanted to do. Yes. And you can see it, it reflects in his accomplishment. He was just an amazing musician. Yes. I think he taught us a lot about work ethic, too. I mean, besides the musical gifts that he gave us, I think um, nobody outworked him. Okay. You know, and I think it's unique when there are certain people in life that, that I know that we, we admire, you know, when you look at, you know, Michael Jordan or, or people like that who, like you, you say, like Michael Jordan was going to be great no matter what. Yeah. But he also outworked everybody. Right. Like he, he practiced his craft like he was the worst player in the world. And when you get that combination, that's what Prince was. Prince mm-hmm. could play rings around anybody. I mean, I met Prince in junior high school. And I thought I could play pretty good. Mm-hmm. And he could just kill me on, and he could take any instrument and play better than anybody that could play it. But then he would work hard. Like he'd, he'd come and rehearse the time for five, six hours, and he'd go rehearse the revolution for five or six hours. Then he'd go in the studio all night, and the next day he'd walk in with a cassette. Back in the cassette days, he'd walk in with a cassette, and it would have like 1999 on it. Wow. And he'd be like, oh, man. And he'd say, yeah, I did that last night. It's like, what? Come on, man. You know, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. crazy, but he'd. But but the work ethic was the thing that we always took away from it, and um, and the fact that he was proud of us and believed in us, um, even as he was competing with us. Yeah. Um, we always felt like he respected what it was that we did, and um, he had such a big hand in that. So yes. amazing. Yes. I, I have three tattoos, and his symbol was one of them. Just an amazing guy. I was in his fan club. He used to send out birthday cards on his birthday to all fan club members. And and, <laughs> and I used to get those cards back in the day. Um, the legendary, the honorary Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Um, what would you say to kids these days that want to play instruments? I'm talking real instruments, guitars, drums, um, saxophones, horns, anything. What would you say to those kids to inspire them? Um, the only thing I would say is that I think we've seen where kids do want to learn instruments and we wish that schools were able to do it in some ways they're not there are music programs available uh that we're involved with that you know hopefully can help that cause but i do think that people do want to learn actual instruments these Mm -hmm. days i've seen you know a little bit of that coming back which i think is a positive thing but to me if you just love music just make music you know just be around it just embrace it um, there's really not one set way to do it, but just really enjoy it. And, and we love inspiring, uh, you know, musicians, uh, and hopefully we continue to do that. All good. Ladies and gentlemen, the honorary Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Parents, teach your kids about these legends that I have right here on the phone. Uh, kids, if you don't know about them, Google them. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. For real, they created some of the best music of our lives. Real talk. Their new project coming soon. The first single from it is Till I Found You from Sounds of Blackness. Gentlemen, I thank you for being an inspiration. Thank you again. And thank you for so many hits over the years. We appreciate you. Thank you. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care of yourself. If you're in Milwaukee, come this way. We got you. All right, man. And tell Jerome I said, what up? I will do. <laughs> My man. All right. God bless. All right, man. All right. Bye-bye.